today we're going to learn about heat engines and we're going to do it by experimenting with different heat sources on a Stirling engine. In order to get more power out, we need to make the hot reservoir hotter and the cold reservoir as cold as we can get it. We'll run the engine in a range of circumstances culminating in trying to answer the question, can we run a heat engine on liquid nitrogen? Hello, welcome back. Today we're going to take a look at the Stirling engine. This is a miniature Stirling engine and it operates on the principle of the difference in temperature between a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. All right, so I'm back with some hot water. This is not boiling, it's just hot water from the tap. Uh, so I'm gonna pour this water into the mug uh, about a centimeter away from the top or so. And we'll put the Stirling engine back on the top here. So. What's happening now is there is a plate on the bottom of this engine, and then there's a material that kind of seals this inner cavity off. It's kind of a gasket on the inside or a bellows. And then there's a top plate here. And what you want to do is introduce a temperature difference between these two plates. Now, nothing much is happening because it takes a second for this thing to warm up enough to do anything. We need to overcome the friction ourselves. So what we'll do is we'll just kind of like get it just going. So we'll just give it a little bit of a helping hand. And what's happening is we're heating the air un underneath this, this moving member. As we heat the air, it wants to expand. So it pushes the bellows up and then it pushes the, the crankshaft, the push rod here. There's two push rods, one on either side, and it's basically pushing it up and turning the wheel. But as the bell, as the flexible member on the inside gets to the cold side, then it cools off. And that uh, cooling off effect gets trans transferred again uh, back to the air inside of there and it tends to cool the air off. So the air inside tends to contract and then the thing moves down again. As soon as the, as the uh, internal member gets to the bottom of the hot area inside, it gets hot again and then it causes the air to expand and the process repeats over and over again. Now, in order to make it go faster, there's a couple of different things we can do. But in, in addition to putting hotter and hotter water in, can you think of another way to make it go faster and get more work out of it? Well, we can make the cold side colder because it's really working because of the hot side working with the cold side. So if we could make the hot side hotter, it should go faster. And if we can make the cold side colder, it should go faster. Let's just take a couple of ice cubes and see if we can put them on. Now it's a little tricky to get them to stay on there, but I haven't changed anything. I haven't increased the temperature of the water inside. I think you can see right away that just by cooling the top plate, we're able to t get this thing to turn faster, right? And the reason is because when the when the, the expansion and contraction process is happening faster, when the internal member gets to the top, it's, it's hitting a colder reservoir, which is causing the gas to contract faster and then start the process over again. So what should we do next to get this thing to go faster? Let's Instead of water ice, which is zero degrees Celsius, we're gonna leave the same water in the bottom and we're gonna put dry ice on the top, which is much colder. All right, now when we put dry ice on the top of this thing, it's at a temperature of negative 78 Celsius. So much colder than water, which is at zero Celsius. So what I have here is actually something I bought, which is called copper tape. So what we're gonna do here is just peel this thing off. And what we will do is try, I don't wanna cover up the bellows down below. I don't want you to, to not be able to see what's going on. Okay, here's our last piece. We're gonna connect it right in there. Try to seal it because later when I put liquid nitrogen on here, it's gonna help to contain it and also to conduct the, the heat uh, there as well. Hot water out of the tap. I don't know the exact temperature, but it's not, uh, it's not boiling. It's pretty, pretty hot. And then we'll put our Stirling engine back on and it'll take a second for it to warm up. And while uh, it starts to warm up, let me break up my dry ice. All right, let's see if we can get our in uh, engine going here. Let's see if it's hot enough yet. So we'll kind of start the process. Now it's gonna make some noise when I put the dry ice on top. Uh, usually it likes to slide around and make noise. It's just the way it goes. Dry ice is frozen carbon dioxide. So what's going on is as it, as it sublimates, it turns directly into gas and then it starts to slide around on the surface uh, wherever it is. Let me put some on this side. All right, we can see it moving much, much faster now. Let me, I think I missed one little spot. I need some ice right there. Let's let it finish doing its little jiggle. And so you can see it moving much, much, much more rapidly when we have a hot reservoir slightly below boiling and a cold reservoir 78 degrees below zero. So now how do we kick it up a notch? What I'd like to do next is I'd like to go get some boiling water so we know that the bottom reservoir would be at 100 Celsius 
and then we'll do ice cubes and then we'll do dry ice, just widening that temperature gradient to see if this engine, how fast we can get this engine moving. So here I have boiling water. And then after that, we will put ice on and then we put dry ice on. So here we have the boiling water. Let's give it a little bit of a friendly start. Notice I didn't have to push very hard at all. And the, the, uh, the process begins, right? All right, here we go. Let's see if I can put these on here without messing too much up. There's one. All right, we'll let it cool down a little bit. I can already tell because I can hear it that it seems to be moving uh, a little bit faster. And then we'll immediately go into the dry eyes. Yeah, you can tell this is definitely faster than it was just a, a second ago. So let's reset new boiling water and then dry ice and see if we can hear it and see it get a little faster. All right, so here we have the boiling water again. We've reset, so let's go ahead and let that. So we'll do our dry ice. I'll just drop them on there. Okay, so we have 100 degrees Celsius on the bottom and negative 78 degrees Celsius on the top. So here we go, let's give it a little bit of a start. Notice we didn't have to push it hardly at all, and it's already up to speed much, much, much faster than the last time. So we'll just kind of let it cool down because I've noticed that it takes a minute or so for the top plate to be cold soaked and for the bottom plate to be hot soaked, for lack of a better word. So you can see right away, I mean, just by my ear, I can see that this thing is operating much, much, much faster. You can think of this as an external uh, heat engine where the heat source is external and the cold plate is external to the actual cylinder. In a car, the uh, explosion is happening inside. That's why we call it internal combustion engine. This is an external heat engine, also called a Stirling engine. Again, you get more energy, more heat, more work, the uh, wider the temperature gap is. Let's go ahead and reset with, uh, with uh, boiling water and then let's put liquid nitrogen on the top and see how fast we can get this thing to go. Liquid nitrogen is about negative 195 degrees Celsius. So whereas dry ice was only 78 below zero, liquid nitrogen is much colder, negative 195 below zero. So let's see if we can get it started. And we can see that it's already operating. And this is why I put my copper tape there to kind of help contain the liquid nitrogen. So it's, it's going pretty good, right? Negative 195. And it boils away right away, but you can still get that, that plate very, very cold. So you can see this thing is really cooking now. Now what happened was that when I pour it on there, it gets, it gets so cold that it sort of like, it sort of seizes up, but then it kind of overcomes that. And you can just see, now as you can see, it's starting to seize up. So let's see what happens. This is kind of neat. I've never really done this before. So let's just let it kind of thaw out a little bit. Something in there is frozen up. Now just for giggles, Let's grab some dry ice, which is not quite as cold, but we can make a nice cloud. So let's drop it in there, something like that. And we'll pour some liquid nitrogen on top. And we can get a little effect there. So you can see this thing is really cooking now. Much, much, much faster than before. So 100 degrees on the bottom, negative 195 degrees on the top. And you can see it's really cooking now. Here we can see a nice comparison in the two most extreme situations. On the left, the engine is powered only by a warm cup of water underneath and ambient room temperature on top. On the right, we have boiling water at 100 Celsius on the bottom and liquid nitrogen at negative 195 Celsius on the top. To me, it's absolutely amazing how much power we can get out of this engine by making the temperature gradient as wide as we can get it. So we're gonna try it. We're going to put liquid nitrogen on the top without any heat source on the bottom. And let's see what happens. Now I have to be careful not to do it too fast. Otherwise I'll basically freeze up the engine. So I don't wanna do that. So I'm just gonna put a little bit, let it slowly, I guess I'm kind of like walking around a little bit and let it kind of slowly get this thing cold. All right, here we go. And there we go. Now we can see it's now finally cold enough. Without any heat source on the bottom, we're able to get this thing to run because it's not the, the, uh, necessarily the absolute temperature that matters. It's the difference in the temperatures between the hot and the cold side. Now, when you dive into studying thermodynamics, you learn about engines in great detail. And you learn that the best engine you can possibly build, 
as part of the laws of our universe, the laws of thermodynamics, is called the Carnot engine or the Carnot cycle. Every engine that we really have, whether it's an internal combustion engine or a Stirling engine like this one, operates on a cycle, some kind of cyclic process, and we're extracting work out of that device coming from somewhere else, usually a temperature gradient, and the best you can do is what we call a Carnot cycle. I'm gonna write down what the efficiency of the Carnot cycle is, right? And the efficiency of a Carnot cycle, I'm gonna draw a picture and show you what it is in a second, is the following. This is the temperature of the hot side of the engine uh, minus the temperature of the cold side of the engine, all divided by the temperature of the hot side of the engine. Now you have to be careful because these temperatures are all in Kelvin. So they're not in Celsius. Kelvin is the absolute temperature scale. Zero Kelvin is absolute zero. You can never get to absolute zero, but it's the theoretical lowest you could go. So what this means is that essentially the wider the temperature gradient you have across whatever engine you can build, the higher efficiency you're gonna have. You take that, that temperature difference, divide it by uh, the hot side temperature, and you will arrive at a number which will, will be a decimal. Now, in, in this situation, we're saying that the number one is like 100% and zero is 0%. Zero so you'll get some decimal between zero and one. If you could build an engine where the hot reservoir, the hot side, could be infinity degrees, so put an infinity Kelvin here, and the cold side were at absolute zero, so zero Kelvin there, and then you divide by the hot side, which is infinity, then you would get infinity divided by infinity, or if you don't like infinity, just think of a million. So if you had a million degrees minus zero, and then you divide by a million degrees, okay, so then the answer is going to be one. So you can, the best you could possibly do is to have a really, really, really hot reservoir and a really, really, really cold reservoir. And there are other limitations of the physical physicalness of your engine that you build because no real engine can ever be a Carnot engine. But I just put this on the board because it's easy for, to look at and know what we were looking at with our physical engine, making the temperature difference uh, wider across the hot and the cold plate seem to get more useful work out of the device. If we want to figure out what the work done by the gas doing it on the piston, as the piston gets bigger and bigger and higher and higher, the gas is pushing up on that piston, how much work is done? Well, what we would do, I don't wanna mess my diagram up, I would draw some dotted lines down here, some dotted lines down here, the pressure is like the force acting, the volume is like the distance sort of moved, and the area under this curve, I would calculate it using calculus, but it would literally be the area under this curve, which would be the gas, uh, the work done by the gas on the piston or the outside environment, and we would call it positive work. Everything takes time in reality. But in an idealized engine, we say once the piston gets to the, to the top, which, which means that this piston is now in contact with the cold reservoir, then the cold reservoir is immediately in contact with the gas and immediately lowers the temperature of the gas immediately, like in a nanosecond or something. So what that does is that tends to lower the pressure of the gas immediately. Now the volume is gonna stay the same, but what would, what would happen is the pressure uh, would drop. Notice the, pr the pressure was right here, but now the pressure drops to a lower val value and it happens at a constant volume. Now this piston has inertia. It's, you can even see it when I turn it. It has inertia. It wants to keep going. Now eventually it's going to slow down. Once it reaches the top and it kind of bends over like this, it's going to start compressing the gas again. But the gas is now at a lower pressure. We're at this point. So it tends to compress the gas. That means it lowers the volume of the gas. It tends to lower the volume of the gas and in the same breath increase the pressure. Because when you squeeze gases, generally the pressure tends to increase again. I want to put here that this is the place when this thing is in contact with the cold uh, reservoir, which we're saying is ice cubes, let's say, zero degrees Celsius. So this would be the case when we were running it on boiling water and on ice cubes on the top, right? So we immediately cool off the gas, immediately. The pressure is immediately lowered and the inertia coming from the energy of the previous cycle starts compressing the gas again. That means the volume goes down and the pressure goes back up when you compress it. Here we're going this direction, like this. Then we're going this direction, like this. Then we're going here, up here. I can even put another little arrow right here if you want. Like here, if you want. So we're gonna be going and tracing a cycle out right here. When we're doing this part of the cycle, what is happening? See, over here, we were putting heat into the gas and the, the energy coming in was, was really what was pushing the piston up. But whenever we're going the other direction, 
what is happening during this? Are we putting energy into the gas? Are we putting heat into the gas? No, we are now touching the cold reservoir. So what we're doing is we're taking heat out of the gas. We've put all the heat in. That is what made it uh, kind of uh, uh, r rise up. And then when it touches the cold reservoir, we start taking heat out of the gas. We cool off the gas, right? And so what we're doing in this phase uh, is during this part of the cycle, we are taking heat out of the gas at the cold reservoir because it's touching that plate, heat is going out. So here we have putting heat into the gas, that's making the thing, the volume get bigger. Here, heat is coming out of the gas and that is making the volume go smaller along this path. Just to start over, we start here, we get to this point, right? Then at this point, we immediately cool off the gas and now we're compressing the gas again. During this, during this part right here, the gas is, let me go up here, the gas is being compressed like this and the volume is going down and the pressure is going up. Now we're essentially back where we start, but we're in contact with the hot plate again. And that means since we're at this point, we're in contact with the hot plate, this is point D, and then right here we reconnect and we basically uh, uh, immediately raise the temperature back to 100 degrees Celsius again because we have now closed the cycle and we have raise the temperature of the gas instantaneously again. So I'll put another arrow right here. So what we do is we bookkeep this as positive work, work that the gas does on the piston, and we bookkeep this as negative work, which is work done on the gas. In other words, the gas is still trying to push, right? But the piston is squishing it down because it's taking energy from the previous cycle and it's squishing it down. So we call that negative work. So during this part of the process, we would call it a positive work on which would be the area of this curve all the way down to the axis here. During this part of the cycle, we would find the area to all the way to the axis, we would call it negative work. And we would take the positive work minus the negative work. And what we would say is that the work that lies between what we call the area in this PV diagram, this is the work done by engine. The network done. And the bigger this area is in the center, the more work is done. And now you can see that the, the temperature here and here yield the boundaries of the PV diagram. And so to get more work out of the engine, you want the biggest area you can get inside the, P, the PV diagram that will mean your engine is doing more work. How can we get more work done? Well, if we have a wider envelope between the hot and the cold reservoirs, then we'll basically have these curves farther apart and we'll have more work done. And that's why we saw up to a limit of freezing our engine that when we put wider and wider temperature gradients, it seemed to run faster, right? And that is essentially the, the point of thermodynamics. That's essentially the point of this whole lesson. Boiling water would basically be moving the hot reservoir up here, giving us more work coming out, right? Then we said, well, we'll just go ahead and put ice cubes on the top and then dry ice and then liquid nitrogen to cool the top uh, faster and faster, or I guess more and more, to be able to shock the gas and cool it down faster when the piston gets up there. And that would be like lowering this. So lowering this is putting ice on the top, Raising this is like putting hot water on the bottom, and then the combination of the two gives us more area in our PV diagram, gives us more work done by this engine. All right, remember, this is an idealized discussion. Real PV diagrams do not look like this. This is idealized. This is not a Carnot engine. It's not the maximum efficiency possible, but I think it gets the point across. I hope you've enjoyed it. Drop me a line, let me know what you think, and follow me on to the next one. Learn anything at mathandscience.com.